Hi my geniuses, welcome to my channel. This is Carol and here we are doing our episode 6 of IELTS training. We are going to practice section 4 today and to know more about the other practices, section 1, section 2 and section 3 and also general information on IELTS, please find the links in the description box. After every video there's a test for you so don't miss it, post your answers in the comment section. Please don't forget to subscribe, click on the bell icon to receive regular updates. Also, if you have any queries or doubts, please ask me in the comment section. Do watch, listen and enjoy my other videos too. So in section 4, it's question 31 to 40 that comprises this section. And it is a monologue based on an academic subject. As a listening module of an exam involves listening, reading, hearing and writing skills, you have to learn to use them simultaneously. Concentrate on the questions one at a time, but be prepared for the next question. So you need to look ahead if you have time. And also listen to the instructions on the tape as well. A general clue is usually given. So this is how section four looks like. You have questions 31 to 40 and answer the questions below write no more than three words and or a number for each answer so here in these blanks you might have to write one word and a number two words and a number three words and a number or just a number so listen to the conversation or the monologue and infer the answers appropriately and put them in here in the question booklet as you listen to the audio Another tip that I would like to give at this point is if you cannot choose between two answers for one question, then write both down for now. One might be the answer to a later question. Then you will know you cannot choose it twice. I'm going to play the audio for this. Please listen and let's go through the answers. Four. You will hear a lecture talking about the way in which elephants communicate. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In today's lecture, I'm going to continue the theme of animal communication, and I'm going to describe some of the latest research into the largest of all land animals, and that is the elephant, of course. Let me begin by briefly outlining the structure of elephant society. Elephants live in layered societies. The basic family unit is formed of small groups of adult females who are related to each other and their young of both sexes. Now the females remain in their families for life. They're highly social, but male elephants leave their families at about 14 years of age. They travel alone or congregate in small loose groups with other males, occasionally joining a family on a temporary basis. When males are ready to mate, they wander widely, searching for receptive females. The family unit, on the other hand, often contains three generations, and it can remain stable for decades or even centuries. Then, each family associates with between one and five other families, probably consisting of their more distant relatives. Scientists call these groups of families bond groups, and bond groups belong in turn to even larger groups called clans. So elephants have a complex social structure. And like other social animals, they have to be able to communicate. But what baffled early naturalists was their ability to communicate over long distances. So they set about researching this question. In one experiment, scientists fitted groups of elephants with radio tracking collars. And what they observed about their behavior really intrigued them. 
because they found that there was some sort of coordination between families. For example, two separate family groups might move in parallel to each other, miles apart, and then change directions simultaneously, either turning or moving towards each other. Now, elephants have a keen sense of smell, which they use whenever they can. But smell alone couldn't account for these synchronized movements, because the wind often carries odors in the wrong direction. So the scientists concluded that the elephants were using their hearing instead, and attention then turned to the nature of elephant calls. In another experiment, scientists from Cornell University in America went to Etosha National Park in Namibia, and they produced a recording of calls made by a female elephant to potential mates. Then they broadcast it. And they did this from a van which was parked more than half a mile from a water hole where several bull elephants were drinking. And two of these looked up, spread their ears wide, and then crunched through the bush towards the loudspeakers. As you can imagine, the scientists may have been alarmed at this point, but the elephants marched straight on past them in their van in search of a female elephant. But the striking aspect of this experiment was that when they replayed their recording, neither the two scientists nor the rest of their team, who were filming from a nearby tower, could hear it. And that's because the sounds that they had replayed were below the lower threshold of human hearing. In scientific terminology, the sounds are infrasonic. Elephants can make these extremely low-pitched sounds because although they have a larynx or voice box that is similar to those of all other mammals, it's much larger. But what do the sounds mean? Scientists from Pittsburgh Zoo in the USA have classified certain infrasonic calls based on when these occur and how other elephants react to them. They found, for example, that when individual family members reunite after separation, they greet each other very enthusiastically, and the excitement increases with the length of time that they've been separated. They trumpet and scream and touch each other. They also use a greeting rumble. This starts at a low 18 hertz. Hertz is a measurement of sound pitch. Crests at 25 hertz, which is a level just high enough to be audible to humans, and then falls back to 18 hertz again. In another example, an elephant attempting to locate its family uses the contact call. This call has a relatively quiet, low tone with a strong overtone, which is clearly audible to humans. Immediately after contact calling, the elephant will lift and spread its ears and rotate its head as if listening for the response. The contact answer is louder and more abrupt than the greeting call, and it trails off at the end. Contact calls and answers can last for hours until the elephant successfully rejoins her family. A third type of call seems to represent a summons to move on. At the end of a meal, one member of a family moves to the edge of the group, typically lifts one leg and flaps her ears. At the same time, she emits a let's go rumble, which arouses the family and they start to move on. Finally, mating activity is associated with yet another group of calls. So our understanding of elephant communication has increased considerably in recent years. However, even with the use of radio tracking collars, it's technically difficult to document the functions of long-range communication. So although scientists are aware that elephants may know the whereabouts and possibly the activities of other elephants that are several miles away, there may be a lot of subtle long-range interactions which are still not evident. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. So that was one easy Section 4. Let's move to the next one. Questions 31 to 40 again. In Section 4 of the listening module, you listen to an academic talk or a lecture. There is only one speaker. You are given time at the beginning to look through the questions, but there's no pause in the middle of the recording. Because of this, it's particularly important to follow the stages of the lecture. The exam task can help you to do this. As with all IELTS questions, make sure you read the instructions closely. Do not write more than the number of words the questions ask you for. In this audio, 
you will hear part of a lecture given by an economist about North American women's attitude to money and saving. So, in the beginning, you would have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Okay. So, we've been looking at the attitudes of various social and cultural groups towards the management of their personal finances, how important they feel it is to save money, and what they save their money for. One aspect that we haven't yet considered is gender. So, if we consider gender issues, we're basically asking whether men and women have different attitudes towards saving money and whether they save money for different things. Back in 1928, the British writer George Bernard Shaw wrote in his Intelligent Women's Guide to Socialism and Capitalism that a man is supposed to understand politics, economics, and finance, and is therefore unwilling to accept essential instruction. He also said, a woman, having fewer pretensions, is far more willing to learn. Now, though these days people might question a lot of the assumptions contained in those statements, recent research does suggest that there are some quite fundamental differences between men and women in their attitudes to economic matters. Let's look at what men and women actually save for. Research studies of women in North America have found that women are far more likely to save for their children's education, and they are also more likely to save up in order to buy a house one day. The same studies have found that men, on the other hand, tend to save for a car, which, by the way, takes a surprisingly large amount of the household budget in North America. But the other main priority for men when saving money is their retirement. When they're earning, they're far more likely to put money aside for their old age than women are. Now, this is rather disturbing, because... In fact, the need for women to save for their old age is far greater than for men. Let's consider this for a moment. To start with, it is a fact that throughout the world, women are likely to live many years longer than men, so they need money to support them during this time. Since women are likely to be the ones left without a partner in old age, they may therefore have to pay for nursing care because they don't have a spouse to look after them. Furthermore, the high divorce rates in North America are creating a poverty cycle for women. It is the divorced women who will most often have to look after the children, and thus they need more money to look after not just themselves, but others. So what can be done about this situation? The population in North America is likely to contain an increasing number of elderly women. The research indicates that at present, for women, it takes a crisis to make them think about their future financial situation. But of course, this is the very worst time for anyone to make important decisions. Women today need to look ahead, think ahead, not wait until they're under pressure. Even women in their early 20s need to think about pensions, for example. And with increasing numbers of women in professional positions, there are signs that this is beginning to happen. Then research also suggests that women avoid dealing effectively with their economic situation because of a lack of confidence. The best way for them to overcome this is by getting themselves properly informed so they are less dependent on other people's advice. A number of initiatives have been set up to help them do this. This college, for example, is one of the educational institutions which offers night classes in money management, and increasing numbers of women are enrolling on such courses. Here, they can be given advice on different ways of saving. Many women are unwilling to invest in stocks and shares, for instance, but these can be extremely profitable. It is usually advised that at least 70% of a person's savings should be in low-risk investments, but for the rest, Financial advisors often advise taking some well-informed risks. Initiatives such as this can give women the economic skills and knowledge they need for a comfortable, independent retirement. The increasing proportion of elderly women in the population is likely to have other economic consequences. You got your answers right. I'll be posting these answers in the description box, so once you've done them, you can cross-check your answers from there. 
Now let's do the test. At the end of the IELTS listening exam, you have 10 minutes to transfer your answers from the exam booklet to the answer sheet. So make sure you do this carefully. Do not write the answers in the wrong spaces or you will lose marks. Only the answers on the answer sheet are marked. You will hear a talk about scientific research in continent Antarctica. So first you have some time to go through the questions 31 to 40. No more than two words and or a number. Tonight I'm going to talk to you about that remarkable continent, Antarctica. Remote, hostile, and at present uninhabited on a permanent basis. For early explorers, it was the ultimate survival contest. For researchers like me, it remains a place of great intellectual challenge. While for the modern tourist, it's simply a wilderness of great beauty. First, some facts and figures. Antarctica is a place of extremes, the highest, coldest, and windiest continent, and over 58 times the size of the UK. The ice cap contains almost 70% of the world's fresh water and 90% of its ice. But with very low snowfall, most of the continent technically falls unbelievably into the category of desert. Huge icebergs break off the continent each year, while in winter, half the surrounding ocean freezes over, which means its size almost doubles. Research and exploration has been going on in Antarctica for more than 200 years and has involved scientists from many different countries who work together on research stations. Here, science and technical support have been integrated in a very cost-effective way. Our Antarctic research program has several summers only stations and two all year round ones. I was based on one of the all year round ones. The research stations are really self contained communities of about 20 people. There's living and working space, a kitchen with a huge food store, a small hospital, and a well equipped gym to ensure everyone keeps fit in their spare time. The station generates its own electricity and communicates with the outside world using a satellite link. Our station, Zero One, had some special features. It wasn't built on land, but on an ice shelf, hundreds of meters thick. Supplies were brought to us on large sledges from a ship 15 kilometers away at the ice edge. Living in the Antarctic hasn't always been so comfortable. Snow buildups caused enormous problems for four previous stations on the same site, which were buried and finally crushed by the weight. Fortunately, no one was hurt, but these buildings became a huge challenge to architects, who finally came up with a remarkable solution. The buildings are placed on platforms, which can be raised above the changing snow level on legs which are extendable. Food is one of the most important aspects of survival in a polar climate. People living there need to obtain a lot more energy from their food, both to keep warm and to undertake heavy physical work. Maybe you know that an adult in the UK will probably need about 1,700 kilocalories a day on average. Someone in Antarctica will need about 3,500, just over double. This energy is provided by foods which are high in carbohydrate and fat. Rations for field work present an additional problem. They need to provide maximum energy but they must also be compact and light for easy transport. Special boxes are prepared, each containing enough food for one person for 20 days. You may be familiar with coffee processed by freeze drying, which preserves the quality of the food product while making a large saving in weight. Well, this type of presentation is ideal in our situation. It wasn't available to earlier polar explorers whose diet was commonly insufficient for their health. I think that being at the cutting edge of science has a special appeal for everyone working in Antarctica, in whatever capacity. 
As a marine biologist, my own research was fascinating. But it's perhaps climate change research that is the most crucial field of study. Within this general field, surveying changes in the volume and stability of the ice cap is vital, since these may have profound effects on world sea levels and on ocean currents. A second important area is monitoring the size of the hole in the ozone layer above Antarctica, since this is an indicator of global ultraviolet radiation levels. Thirdly, bubbles in the ice sheet itself provide an index of pollution, because frozen inside them are samples of previous atmospheres over the past 500,000 years. And these provide us with evidence for the effects of such human activities as agriculture and industry. There are an increasing number of opportunities for young people to work for a period in Antarctica, not only as research assistants in projects like mine, but also in a wide range of junior administrative and technical positions, including vacancies for map makers. I hope that the insights I've provided will encourage you to take up these opportunities in this fascinating continent. Hope you did well. Post your answers on the comment section. Episodes 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 links are in the description box. Let's look at the next module in my next video. Please don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, and share. This is Carol. See you next week.